Hindsight is 2020. But as we view the aftermath of the 2020 election, what can both parties learn? And what does the future look like moving forward? John Cole, the managing editor of Politics PA, will join us to break down those questions and more. That's all coming up right here, right now. I'm Sam Chan, and this is Face the Issues. Good evening and welcome to Face the Issues. I'm Sam Chen. They say hindsight is 2020, and certainly as we look at the postmortem of the 2020 elections, there's a lot for both parties to learn. The Democrats flipped the White House, but in route, Republicans flipped nearly 15 seats in the House of Representatives, not to mention competitive state battles across the country. So what is there to learn for both parties and what does this mean moving forward? John Coles, the managing editor of Politics PA, is a friend of the program. Well, welcome him back. John, welcome back to Face the Issues. Thanks for having me back, Sam. It's always a good time. It's always good to have you here, my friend. And uh, before we get started, how, how are you and your family doing amid a very chaotic 2020? <laughs> All is well here in Philadelphia, no complaints. It was certainly a busy time around the election as there was so much to cover here in uh, the battleground state of Pennsylvania. But even though as we're unwinding, there's still a lot to talk about with this election. And I know later in the show, we'll believe it or not, there'll be other elections to cover before you know it that are of great importance to the state as well. Yeah, it seems like the political cycle never ends. Uh, John, let me let me start. The, the state of Pennsylvania uh, obviously has been in the news. This is you know, we, us in, in Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Georgia, uh, five states that President Trump won in 2016, that Vice President Biden has flipped in 2020, been central in the news, a lot of recounts, a lot of lawsuits. What, talking about Pennsylvania, and that's where we'll keep our focus here today, there's been a lot of, of conversation about um, why the, the, the counts were delayed and why ballots were coming in late. I kind of want us just to go back before the election can you explain for us why were mail-in ballots allowed to be accepted after Election Day? And why was the counting of these ballots so delayed in Pennsylvania? So, Sam, we kind of discussed this a bit during the primary, how, I guess, mail-in ballot voting um, in Pennsylvania at large is relatively new. Act 77 was passed in 2019. It was basically an overhaul of the uh, voting in Pennsylvania where uh, they they call it no excuse mail and ballot. So you don't need an excuse to vote by mail. Anyone could do it. And that certainly changed the landscape of voting in Pennsylvania. Granted, other states do this as well, but it was the first time in Pennsylvania. So I think that's part of the reason we've seen some of those delays and experienced some of those issues. In the primary, it was a little more evident in certain parts of the state. Again, we know that certain counties had a little more success with it during the primary. Allegheny County seemingly didn't have the same amount of issues that Philadelphia did. Uh, they're the two biggest counties in the state, of course. Uh, for the general election, we, of course, saw an increase of voters from the primary. As a matter of fact, uh, Pennsylvania broke a record for um, their highest voter turnout, the amount of people voted in the state, and their percentage of voter turnout in the state reached all-time all highs in 2020. So that also led to possibly some confusion among people. There was millions of voters decided to vote by mail this time, and they were not able to tabulate those results until the polls were closed. So that and also takes a little bit longer to do so. So I think we all knew due to Pennsylvania expecting it to be a close result. We weren't going to find out on election. And I think that did uh, cause some confusion to some voters, maybe to the average voter who wasn't exactly familiar with, you know, why is it taking longer than usual? It's due to them not being able to count those votes until the polls are uh, closed. So there's a state law that stipulates that the, even the mail-in ballots that are received before the election cannot begin to be counted until election day at the earliest. Correct, exactly. And that's something that was a, a big debate in the state legislature leading up to the election. I think there was a, there was a bill that tried to allow, um, I believe it's referred to as early canvassing um, mm -hmm. of, of votes, where some states have that. I believe Florida has it and uh, various other states have that. Pennsylvania did not. So again, that's why there was, uh, you know, on election, you saw there was a significant difference why President Donald Trump did much better in the vote by you know, people who voted in person. Mm -hmm. get a significant advantage. But we saw that lead continually chip away when the vote by mail started to be tabulated because by and large, Democrats embraced, uh, embraced voting by mail. And it's not a coincidence in the sense that President Donald Trump for months was railing against it. He kept mm -hmm. talking about, uh, the, in his eyes, the ills of it. 
So I think it's not a, a huge shocker that his, he's, again, he's very popular among his base, and his base decide to vote in person. But again, Democrats embraced vote by mail in the primary, and it's no surprise they did so on election day. And as results started to come in, uh, and they, they were being counted, it was certain that um, you know the Democrats are, or Joe Biden was going to catch Donald Trump. And so the, those votes that came in, you know, it's the, the count. The count as it grew for for Vice President Biden after the election is because the majority of those were. Uh, mail-in ballots, correct? Because they were not permitted to be counted. So we didn't see those numbers being added, the mail-in votes, we didn't see those numbers being added in necessarily on election day in a lot of these areas that they were not counted until after the election. That's exactly the case, Sam. And again, I understand to the the voter who likes to have their instant gratification, who likes to know on election <laughs> night, you know, everyone li- likes to go to bed knowing who is the uh, victor. That was not the case in 2020. But quite frankly, this was something we kind of saw coming. We knew that it wasn't just due to how, you know, the polling indicated that it would be close in a lot of battleground states that mm-hmm. I think we knew it was not necessarily uh we didn't expect it, I suppose, to be called in Pennsylvania on election night. I think so. This mm-hmm. wasn't shocking. Although hopefully moving forward, we're able to come up with a process that they're able to count those early mail and ballots earlier, um, you know, prior to the polls closing so that we have a bit of a speedier um, time in uh, counting those results. Sure. I want to ask you, John, I mean, obviously the president has challenged the results of this. Uh, election in multiple states, including here in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, he, he lost a court challenge in the uh, U.S. District Court for the Middle District of Pennsylvania, Judge Matthew Brand, who is, formerly it was a, a party official in the Republican Party, but ruled against the Trump campaign. And then on the Third Circuit, three-judge panel, a majority opinion written by Judge Stefanis Bibas, who is a, a appointee of President Trump, uh, it was a unanimous decision uh, to rule against the president. The, the president was asking for recounts to be stopped, asking for ballots that were uh, accepted after election day to be thrown out, or counts that did not occur by the end of election day to be stopped. Uh, where where does the president's campaign go from here? I mean, for, you've been following this. What do you make of this entire situation with the lawsuits, and, and what avenues does the president have left to try to stop this? Well, Pennsylvania certified their results on November 24th. So again, the results are final in the state. However, President Donald Trump's legal team and various Republicans have joined in on various efforts in different court, uh, in different courts and uh, multiple lawsuits, like you alluded to already. They've been shot down in multiple courts. I suppose they can try to take it to the Supreme Court, mm-hmm. but even there, it's very unexpected that it will change any of the outcomes in Pennsylvania. And mind you, it's not as if the Trump campaign and various Republicans are challenging it just in Pennsylvania. We're seeing the same thing in Georgia, Wisconsin, Michigan, various other battleground states that were very close but flipped from supporting Trump in 2016 to Biden in 2020. So we're seeing that effort ongoing still for the Trump campaign. But again, uh, it's very un- it's, it's unexpected that it will change anything. And again, at this point, Pennsylvania's results have been certified, and the electors will be official in um, mid-December. They make it official. So again, we're just uh, we're getting close to that date now, as you know, that it will be official for uh, former Vice President Joe Biden, I guess now President-elect Joe Biden. Yeah, he will be awarded that. And then, of course, inauguration uh, will be in January. John, one of the things that we hear being brought up is the idea that the, in, in the president's alleged this both publicly and in lawsuits that uh, the votes should not be accepted after Election Day, that votes uh, mail in voting itself is dangerous. There, is, there has been uh, proposals in the state legislature to move against mail-in voting, but the, to your point, the original Act 77, was that not a bipartisan proposal that was introduced? Correct. Act 77 was a bipartisan proposal. Again, this was a massive uh, piece of um, you know, election reform legislation where both sides kind of came to the table with something they really wanted done. Democrats, again, were by and large proponents of mail-in voting. And that was a significant portion of the legislation. However, let's not forget, Republicans also wanted something in return and something they got uh, rid of, which, again, we'll talk about in the next segment, which probably actually worked in their favor down ballot, is that there was no straight party ticket voting in 2020, which, again, to those who, you know, let's say if they're partisan voters or they like to vote straight party ticket previously in Pennsylvania, you could have went to the ballot box, pressed a button, you know, indicating Democrat or Republican, and you would have voted for every single Democrat or every single Republican on the ballot. 
that was removed uh, as part of Act 77. So this time you had to physically, if you're doing vote by mail, you had to physically fill out every single candidate you wanted to vote for. Or if you were at the ballot box as well, you had to uh, physically, again, uh, press every single candidate on there as, a press, as opposed to pressing one button. So that was a key part of the legislation. It passed on a bipartisan fashion in the state house and the state senate. Mind you, Republicans have a majority in both, and Republicans actually voted for it in larger numbers than Democrats because a lot of Democrats are skeptical of the losses they believe they would have if they took away straight party voting. And by the way, it does appear that that is the case. We'll talk about in the next segment on some of those down ballot races. Sure. So this is a bipartisan push. Republicans voted for it. Now they're talking about taking it back. Some of them are. Uh, the other issue that came up came with the Secretary of State extending that deadline. I mean, I think legally there, there's potentially a valid argument here that the Secretary of State as an unelected official doesn't have uniform ability to move that, that deadline on when those ballots come in. I guess my question here becomes the Trump campaign never didn't seem to challenge this until after the election results. Right? I mean, is there a sense in which, I mean, how do you challenge something after the election to try to throw out ballots that were already cast? I mean, isn't this something that should have been challenged well, well in advance? You would have assumed so, Sam. And again, at this point in time, again, the, the results in the state are certified. So at this point, you know, they'll keep, you know, I'm sure they will continually try to challenge different aspects of voting, um, you know, some of the ballots in the courts. Again, maybe it'll go to the Pennsylvania, or not, excuse me, not the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, mm -hmm. the United States Supreme Court. But again, ultimately, the, there's been an overwhelming of defeat, uh, defeat after defeat in various states. Again, this is not just a Pennsylvania issue. We're talking Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona. Georgia, various battleground states where the Trump campaign has seemingly tried to challenge uh, certain aspects of voting by mail and things like that. Um, they've been unsuccessful in a large majority of those. So it's very unlikely that we will see any significant change. And again, why they didn't do it earlier, uh, <laughs> you'd have to ask them, Sam, not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, we'll put an open, open invitation to them to come on and try to explain <laughs> that. John, that, that's insightful. Thank you. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Face the Issues. John, thank you again for joining us. Uh, I, I want to get to some of the other surprising situations from the election. Before we do that, though, the obviously with Pennsylvania in the spotlight, in the national spotlight, there's been a number of our uh, Pennsylvania elected officials who have been on uh, kind of in, in the spotlight. Uh, and I think all of us are, are at this point familiar with Senator Casey's maps. Um, <laughs> Attorney General Josh Shapiro's son walking in on one of his interviews. Of course, <laughs> Lieutenant Governor Fetterman and his wife uh, bickering about with uh, with Room Raider about you know what what how much of a hostage situation his background looked like. Uh, we can't forget the Four Seasons Landscaping Company. For you covering and watching this, uh, I mean, how much fun has this been, or how chaotic has this been? Again, Sam, it, it's the funny thing is this that all those instances you talked about have basically occurred after election day. Mm -hmm. So again, even though it's funny, uh, covering politics, you expect everything will slow down significantly after the election. We'll have a bit of return to normalcy, but truly, we're still dissecting these results and will be for quite some time. Uh, you alluded to uh, Shapiro and Federman; they've certainly made the rounds on national media, and I don't think that's an accident, as mm -hmm. both have been rumored to be interested in 2022 runs for higher office. So, of course, it doesn't hurt to take those national media hits. Senator Bob Casey uh, got a lot of attention from election Twitter. They were enjoying his maps. And then he really uh, had some buzz where uh, after Pennsylvania certified the results, he pulled out a beer yeah. and took a sip of it in <laughs> celebration. There was a controversy wondering uh, if he was actually taking a sip of that on the Tuesday at 11 a.m. when he posted the tweet, or was this pre-recorded another time? So I won't get into that discussion. Well, I um, like the fact that you used the <laughs> phrase, he had a buzz, <laughs> 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 or got a buzz. <laughs> no pun intended there. But um, And then, of course, the Four Seasons uh, landscaping, that's actually not too far from where I live, Sam. That's in northeast oh Philadelphia. God. Um, a good 15 minute ride per se. But that morning I woke up and of course you get the press releases, you know, and I checked out and I saw four seasons. I automatically assumed like most would, it would be down in center city at, you know, the hotel. Um, uh, of course we were all shocked to see that it was a landscaping spot in Northeast Philadelphia off state road, right near sweet Lucy's a very good barbecue joint. But anyway, <laughs> um, it was, uh, you know, and that was the day I think they, that was a Saturday and that was the day they certified the results. For Biden. So that was very well the last public event that uh, that was the last event that before Biden was declared the victor, according to the Associated Press. Mm -hmm. So, no, there's been a plethora of things to talk about, Sam. And again, even though uh, 
we're a month past the election now. Um, <laughs> we're still digging into a lot of these results still. Sure. Uh, you know, part of the, some of the results that we had alluded to earlier, you mentioned that the down ballot swung very differently. And in the intro, I said it was a very good night for Democrats in the sense that they won the White House, a very bad night for Democrats in the sense that they seemingly lost so much else across not just the state, but the country. Other than pickups in uh, the state legislature of Massachusetts, Democrats largely lost a lot of seats, uh, House seats in Congress, House seats in the state legislature. Um, and statewide offices in the state of Pennsylvania, the attorney general, or sorry, the auditor general and the treasurer seat. I mean, these are two seats that in the last 50 years have combined gone Republican three times by two people. Uh, Barbara Hafer, who then became a Democrat, held both offices. And of course, state treasurer Bud Dwyer, who ultimately committed suicide. The, the, otherwise, it, these have been Democrat seats and both have flipped. And, and now we have Tim DeFore as the next, next auditor general, the first African-American to win statewide seat office in Pennsylvania. And uh, of course, Stacey Garrity, surprisingly a little bit here, defeating the uh, Democrat incumbent, Joe Tricella. Why? How did this happen? And what observations have you seen looking at these down ballot races? Again, we're still dissecting this right now, Sam. But truly, again, I think there was a the thought that if Biden won the state, there would be coattails as traditionally would, you would think in politics. We didn't have that this time. And dare we say, outside of Biden carrying Pennsylvania, Republicans had a good night in the Commonwealth. Uh, Josh Shapiro had a, a comfortable enough victory. He won by over four points against Republican challenger Heather Heidelbaugh. I think that was expected. The Cook political report going into that race had it as likely Democrat. So mm -hmm. that wasn't a shock, that result. But truly, the, uh, I guess the biggest surprise we can start off with is the treasurer's race. Joe Torcello is an incumbent, won by multiple points in 2016, although Donald Trump carried the state in 2016. Torcello won his race by mm. multiple points as a first-time candidate statewide against uh, Otto Voigt. And again, we're seeing that on election night, Garrity had a lead. Torcello started to chip away a bit as mail results came in. But he conceded the following week, and that was truly, you know, uh, a very, very big surprise. And then uh, she won by, even though she won by less than a point, it's still a victory for Republicans, and that's significant for in Harrisburg because we're going to see as the budget uh, gets discussed in the future, there will not be a Democratic, uh, you know, treasurer there, and of course, her auditor general. We should also talk about as well. Uh, that was an open seat, so perhaps that one isn't as uh, big of a surprise. Um, it was Democrat Nina Ahmad, from, a former deputy mayor of Philadelphia, against Dauphin County Controller uh, Republican Tim DeFore. DeFore won by multiple points. He mm. actually uh, scored about a three-point victory over Ahmad. That race was called on Friday, uh, so three days after the election. His race was called the same day as Shapiro's. It was pretty clear that he had a pretty substantial lead on election night, even though it's not a blowout victory winning by three points. It's significant that he flipped that seat because Eugene D. Pasquale, who was term limited, he won rather comfortably in 2016. He won by multiple points. And the seat flipping, that means that in the process of DeFore winning, he flipped multiple counties that previously voted for the Democrat last time. So it's really significant that although Biden won of the three statewide races, um, the three row offices as they're referred to, two of them are now held by Republicans. And in 2016, even though Trump won, all three Democrats held those seats. So it's a pretty significant change of the guard in Harrisburg. Why do you think that is? I, why, why, you know, why this reverse effect? I, I think one could either attribute it to a, multiple things. So I don't. We, none of us have a clear cut answer. One could say that ultimately there was a uh, a denial, or I guess Trumpism was uh, rejected at the ballot box. You could say not Republicanism mm -hmm. at large, mm -hmm. and we could talk about more of the down ballot stuff. Is where again Trump ended up losing in Pennsylvania, but that doesn't mean that as a whole Pennsylvanians are rejecting Republicans because. Trump truly is unique. Um, you know, even though he is the uh, he's the president, he's the face of the Republican Party in, in essence. But not every Republican matches his tone, his message on every issue. And I think that's part of the reason. Another thing we could look to, maybe Act seventy seven had a, uh, an impact in it, where that the loss of down ballot, uh, you know, loss of excuse me, the straight party ticketing that may have very well had an impact in certain areas where people who are traditionally used to going to the ballots pressed either D, pressed R, and they went about their day. There's a chance that some of those voters may have just voted at the top of the ticket and they said, uh, who cares about those other races? Again, we don't know quite yet because, again, we'll never know the exact reason why some of those other uh, candidates lost, but I think those are things we can point to. And then we could also look 
at the state legislature. I mean, Democrats were really hoping to flip the state house. That was their target in Pennsylvania the whole cycle. I mean, there was even uh, there was national outlets. I think the Cook Political Report might have even had it as a toss up. You had the National Journal had it in the top 10 most likely state legislators to flip in the country. It was getting national attention. They were raising a ton of money. And they picked up a good amount of seats in 2018. So people thought they would just keep up the momentum. Not only did the Democrats not flip the state house, Sam, they lost seats, a net loss of three seats. And one of, the, or one of their losses, which is significant, was House uh, Minority Leader Frank Dermody, mm-hmm. who's in his reelection, been in Allegheny County to Republican Kerry Del Rosso. And a few other seats were flipped in Western PA. Those are those old Democrat areas that have flipped. Uh, now they're pretty conservative. And it's really significant that, again, Democrats went in with high hopes, thinking this is the time where they, could, they thought they could finally take back the state legislature, which has been in Republicans' control for quite some time. They were unsuccessful. Not only were they unsuccessful, they lost seats. So there's a lot of thinking that, although Democrats, they're happy that Biden won, they're not spiking the football. This isn't like an overall victory. For Democrats, they're you know they're they're you know they're looking at what went wrong at these down ballot races, and they need to they are going to have to try to rectify it in 2022, or else we we'll, there's a chance that you know there will be a governor's race in 22, Heck, and if a Republican wins that race, they could have control in all the chambers unless Democrats figure out exactly what went wrong in those down ballot races. Although Biden was successful. Yeah, we have uh, just about a minute here, and I want to ask you about 2022 real quick. Uh, you mentioned the governor Senate race. Obviously, a big announcement, Senator Pat Toomey is retiring. Governor Tom Wolf is term limited. The, the Republican Party is now without a national, a national leader in, in the sense that the president is, been, is lost. The Democrat Party uh, ha, is, is, has had a lot of their bench in Pennsylvania decimated by this election. What do you see potentially coming out for 2022? Who should we keep our eye on? Oh, man, Sam, there are so many people already throwing their hats, or not officially throwing their hats in the ring, but there has been uh, many articles speculating there is interest from Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, um, Attorney General Josh Shapiro, various members of Congress. And then, of course, on the Republican side, they're going to be it's going to be wide open as well there. We've heard names like Doug Mastriano possibly interested for governor, um, maybe like a guy Russian thaller out in Western PA. There is going to be Oh, and even Brian Fitzpatrick in the Philly suburbs, even though he's a different Republican from the Trump type, he still could make a run. So again, they're just a few names. And by the way, there's going to be a ton in both the governors and Senate prime. I'm just saying a few that come to the top of my head, and I know we're running out of time, but that will be something we are covering very closely for the next two years. So this could be a wild ride. Uh, John Cole, thank you so much. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Face the Issues. John Cole from Politics PA, thank you again so much for joining us. Uh, John, I, I, you know, we, every time we're together, we, we love talking a little bit of sports. You've covered sports uh, before you were doing the political gig. Uh, Matt Rule, head coach of Carolina Panthers in the NFL, uh, a temp, former Temple head coach, then went to my alma mater at Baylor. Uh, they're not, they don't have a winning record, but, but what do you make of uh, how uh, our friend Coach Rule is doing? So again, Sam, even though uh, the Panthers are under 500, they're in a difficult division because they have the New Orleans Saints, of course, and um, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in their way. Having said that, though, I mean, even though they're under 500, it's not a, it's not a train wreck of a first season considering Teddy Bridgewater, their quarterback, has been banged up. Sadly, he's been dealing with some injury issues. And then we've seen quite a few, I mean, selfishly as a Temple alum, um, it's kind of neat to see some of those old Temple guys get some play. Uh, P.J. Walker, the quarterback, while I was a Temple, uh, you know, while I was covering sports at Temple University. Uh, Walker got a start recently, and um, you know he had the win, which is exciting. Um, there's been Robbie Anderson, uh, former Temple Owls, caught quite a few touchdown passes. And quite a few of the coordinators went, followed rule from Temple to Baylor, and now to the NFL, which is pretty neat. Phil Snow, the defensive coordinator, is one of them. There's been a few. I think Ed Foley as well. But point being, though, it's really, uh, you know, it's been exciting to root for him. And even though, and I, I guess the reason I bring them up, because uh, sadly, my Philadelphia Eagles have not had a good season, <laughs> uh, even though the NFC East is a train wreck. So in theory, they're not mathematically eliminated. So again, there's still a chance, even though, the, they, again, it's been a horrendous season for the Birds. Um, there's still a chance they're, uh, they can be competitive. But having said that, though, to try to divert my attention away from the train wreck that has been the Philadelphia Eagles this season, I look to the Panthers. Even though they're under 500, uh, it's giving me something to root for seeing uh, Matt Rule and the Panthers. Even though they're not, uh, they're not great this year, you're seeing the building blocks of a team that very well could be good in a few years. 
Yeah, and Matt Rule, of course, also a Penn State guy is where he played. Mm-hmm. Um, you, know, you, you talked about the Philadelphia Eagles, NFC East. I mean, the joke election night was that Donald Trump could still win the NFC East <laughs> at, at this rate. On the other side of the state, the Pittsburgh Steelers, I mean, at, at the time of our recording, they're undefeated. Uh, what do you think uh, are, you know, the chances are for this, our friends over in the western half of our state to potentially see a Super Bowl run? Oh, it's very much legitimate. I mean, the fact that they're undefeated this late in the season, um, let's not forget, they do have a couple of games at the end of the season that are pretty difficult against teams that are over 500. Granted, they've beaten every team they faced thus far. They've looked very, very impressive. Um, sadly for them, the AFC certainly seems more challenging than the NFC. Mm-hmm. So, of course, they'd have to deal with the defending Super Bowl champion, uh, Kansas City Chiefs, most likely in the playoffs. We'll see how that all shakes out. But no, if I was uh, in the Western Pan, if I was a Steelers fan, I'd be thrilled with the way this season's going because, again, Um, undefeated this late in the season is no joke. The Steelers are a legitimate Super Bowl contender. Yeah, and it's certainly difficult being a Philadelphia fan, I think, between the Phillies bullpen, uh, the the 76ers, (laughs) that that entire situation, and now now the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, John Cole, real quick, uh, your prediction, who do you think is going to play in the Super Bowl? Ooh, I guess I don't want to upset our, you know, uh, I have to just say, now I think the Kansas City Chiefs go back. I think they win it all again. As much as I, I like our friends in Western PA, and I, I'm rooting for the Steelers as long as the birds are out, but no, I think it'll be the Kansas City Chiefs coming out of the AFC and the NFC. I'm going to go with the Saints from New Saints. Orleans. And I think right. the Chiefs, yeah, give me a repeat of the Saints. Patrick Mahomes is too good. All right, Chiefs and Saints in the Super Bowl. You heard it here first. John Cole, managing editor of Politics PA. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, that is all the time we have tonight. I want to thank you for tuning in and continue to tune in with us week in and week out right here on Face the Issues. My name is Sam Chan. On behalf of all of us here at Face the Issues, thank you and good night.